Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, joining us today. Um, just wanted to introduce myself super quickly. I'm Stephanie Landers, Program Manager in the Keller Center. And um, my office is in the Princeton Entrepreneurial Hub, which if um, in a perfect world, we would be there today having a nice lunch um, in our event room. But instead, we're on this webinar, and I'm happy that everyone is joining via Zoom. Just wanted to let everyone know that um, the session is being recorded. Um, that's so that anyone who couldn't join can watch it at a later time. And it also helps us to um, you know, determine what, what things we wanna refine for our next webinar. So um, we just wanna remind you to please keep yourself muted when you're not speaking. Um, if at any point you have a question, um, you wanna speak, you can unmute yourself. You can though submit questions um, through the chat room feature. Um, and we also would encourage you to put your camera on so that we can see um, who, who is all in this session. Um, that way we'll feel a little bit more like we are actually in the entrepreneurial hub having this discussion rather than a virtual one. Um, now, I just wanted to very quickly introduce Charlie Kreitzberg who has very graciously agreed to um, host this session. Um, he is, uh, has 40 years of experience in, in, um, in UX and product conceptualization, team management, um, usability research, prototyping. Um, he is a wonderful Princeton colleague of ours and he's always um, helping out with students with, the, with projects and, and, um, and if, if we were on campus, I think there would be a lot of office hours where students can drop in and ask questions. So I think this is a really great kickoff um, for, for us um, to be learning remotely about um, user experience. So I won't run through his entire bio because it's very long and, and impressive. Um, maybe he can tell you a little bit more about himself. Um, I'm going to pass it over to him and I want to thank everyone again for being here and um, take it away, Charlie. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, this is great. Now let me see. Um, let me share my screen here. So can everybody see this okay? Yes. Great. So welcome, I'm so happy to be doing this today. I do also wish we were together at the, at the Hub and I wish I were having lunch, but I'll get some when this is over. Um, it's been really interesting from a UX point of view, um, trying to deal with Zoom and all of this, um, um, you know, the, the, the experience of working remotely and learning remotely and teaching remotely. One thing I learned, uh, a couple of days ago was that the side-by-side -side mode works really well uh, if you don't know that. So what happens is if you pick that on the top, then you get the gallery on the right uh, and the slides yeah. on the left. And that's pretty good. I, I do uh, invite you to start your video because it's really great to, um, to, uh, to see the faces and to try to feel as connected as we can. Um, and, um, yeah, so hello and welcome. I, listen, I, what I'd like to try to do is keep this as much of a conversation as we can. I, I'm not a great lover of lectures and I'm sure you're not either. So we're all adults and I think we can, we, we don't have to do too much worrying about, uh, managing this. I think if you have something to say, you know, keep yourselves on mute so you don't get too much background noise. But then if you have a thought, you want to say something, uh, press your space bar, you'll unmute yourself and just jump in. The better the conversation, I think the more we'll all enjoy this. Uh, I also have some thanks to give. There's an African proverb that says it takes a village to raise a child. And uh, it apparently also takes a village to put together a webinar. Uh, Stephanie and I started talking about this, I think it must have been, what, about eight months ago. Um, and uh, a whole bunch of folks have been helping out with this, and I, I just really want to 
thank them in an alphabetical order, Carrie Collins, uh, who works for the uh, Keller Center and is one of my UX colleagues. Um, everybody I'm going to mention here is a, is a, a UX colleague. Um, Greg Duncan, who's a Princeton alum, is a webmaster at Keller and uh, has another terrific uh, UX colleague. Uh, Gina Sesta from the, um, uh, from the Keller Center also has been just really terrific in pulling all of this together. Uh, and, and I thank her for everything that she's been doing. And Susan Spragan is the other person in the uh, user experience office here at Princeton. Uh, she and I, you should know, are available to all of you for mentoring, for support. Susan runs the Usability Lab, which at the moment uh, is not open, um, but we uh, are enabling remote usability testing. And so uh, please feel free to contact us for any sort of support you might need in user experience, because if you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to be a successful business in the 20th century, UX is something you really have to understand uh, and deal with. So our topic for today is understanding your users. And I want to really start focusing, uh, to put a little structure on this, on three elements about this, which is why, what, and how. So the first question uh, is, why should we care about understanding our users? Maybe that seems like a totally obvious question. Um, although I have to tell you that in my experience in life and in some 40 years in the IT industry, it's not something that everybody uh, accepts. The second thing is, what do we need to understand about our users? This gives us some sense of structure. And finally, how can we learn about users? And most importantly, how can we turn insights into actionable design? Because the goal of all of this ultimately is to inform the design that we do. So let's start by talking about the why we should care about understanding our users. And um, I guess one of the answers is that if you don't understand your users, you can make terrible mistakes. And um, here's one of the classics in business. Um, I, I actually remember when this car came out. This was the Ford Edsel. And for about a year, this Ford Motor Company spent an incredible amount of money on this car. It was supposed to be the car of the future. It was going to completely change the world. They put this thing out there and nobody cared and nobody liked it. And I think it lasted about a year and Ford ended up closing the entire division. They lost something on the order in today's dollars of $2 billion uh, in this debacle. Another one, which is, uh, this is the Commodore PET. I have a lot of affection for this particular machine. This was, I think, the first piece, one of the first PCs that came out that was really there were a couple of others um, that were sort of hobby machines, but this was really the first um, machine that was commercial. Um, it's, it's a personal love of mine because I had serial number 006. And um, when I got this machine, um, must have been about 1981 or 1982, I turned this thing on and I started typing in basic and I was absolutely blown away. I've been using computers um, since about 1964, which is when I entered the field. Uh, but the computers I used were huge. These were room-filling mainframes, and they cost millions of dollars. And I had never heard of something this small, and I didn't believe it could actually work. But it did work, and it worked amazingly well. Um, the thing that's interesting to me on the side is the cassette tape player recorder, which is what they use for recording programs. So if you wrote a program, you would then put in a cassette tape 
you'd press record, it would take about three or four minutes and the tape would record it. And then later you could take that tape, put it in and put the program back in. There were no discs at that point. Um, but Commodore made a really bad mistake, which is they, um, they were selling about 2 million machines. They were completely beating up Atari, IBM, and Apple. And those companies were absolutely in terror. And then Commodore decided they would enhance the machine. And they came out, the, after the PET, they came out with the Commodore 64, which was black and white machine. It used a TV set. It was their huge seller. They said, oh, we're going to come out with a Commodore Plus 64 Plus which is color and everybody's going to want it. And guess what? Nobody wanted it. And Commodore went into bankruptcy. And uh, interestingly enough, in my consulting life, one of my clients was QVC. And I used to go down to the QVC headquarters, which is in Pennsylvania, which was Commodore's old headquarters. And uh, often when I was talking to the folks at QVC about the importance of UX and technology, I'd say, remember where you are. Uh, there was once a leading company in these headquarters and they did not survive because they made mistakes. So that leads to this basic thing, which is that when you make bad assumptions about your users, you make mistakes. Um, here are three, and uh, you may have some uh, assumptions. I'm just, you may have just some assumptions on your own, of your own that we should add to this. These are three that I, I, I frequently uh, found. One is we understand our users. A lot of times we think we understand our users, but we don't understand our users. A second one is that we think that users understand things the same way we do. And often users understand things differently. They have, uh, and we'll go into more depth about what that means specifically. And the third one, which is one I think that has grown out of the fact that the computer industry started in business, is that um, our users are going to make the effort to learn how to use our products. Well, when I started in this field, many years ago, it didn't matter whether the stuff we produced was usable, because you know what? We were paying people to use these things because they were employees, and the answer was learn to use it or lose your job. But once the internet came out and, and uh, computers shifted from being this sort of arcane environment to a, a mass market thing, all of a sudden, users became discretionary. They don't have to use our thing. They can go to a different system. They can go to a different vendor. Uh, it's completely discretionary whether they use it or not. So the fact is very often users will not make the effort to learn how to use our product uh, unless they really see a payoff. Now let me point to the icon that's at the bottom of the screen, the blue circle. That is a, a, an indication that I'd like to, uh, on the slide, uh, offer you the opportunity to jump in and make comments or or chat. So let me invite you. Does anybody have any comments, thoughts, other assumptions that you're aware of? And don't be shy. So one one quick question. Hi. Sure. Uh, I'm Yu Zhou. I'm a grad student in East Asian Studies. Um, so in terms of the users, is part of the research of user experience team um, has to do with the fact that of, have to do with defining who are our users, or do we take that as a given fact when we proceed with user experience research? No, we do not take that as a given fact, and defining who our users are is absolutely basic. Um, we have to understand who our users are. And the problem is we also have to find a way to segment our users because we can't, not every user is the same. And we can't design obviously for every individual user. So one of the things we have to do early on is to figure out 
how do our users clump into different groups that have the same needs? And that's not always obvious. Uh, you know, we talk about, for example, think about Princeton University. We have undergraduate students. Are they all the same? I mean, I don't know. Um, who would be the different groups? And then we have graduate students. Are they the same as undergraduates or different? We have uh, postdocs and people who work in, lab in laboratories. Are they the same as the graduate students? Are they the same as professors? Um, because they all have research, uh, researchers. So um, figuring that out, and I'm going to talk later about how some of the ways we do this and uh, how, how we manage this, but no, I don't think we take it as a given. Susan, do you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, indeed, there's a lot of um, effort and consideration required to think about who your users are and think about the roles that they are in as they're inter interacting with your interface. Um, so, you know, for instance, a graduate student, you know, has their own research press, but then there are other times when they themselves are teaching. So now they're in a teaching role and they might need to use a different set of tools while they're teaching than while they're doing their own research. So not only do you think about them as a person, an individual, in addition, you think about the roles they are um, in and the tasks that they, they are trying to perform when they're faced with your interface. And I just want to add another um, ideas about assumptions. You know, so important is it, as we're going to discuss in a bit, about uh, user research so that, you know, often if you ask somebody, so tell me about your job, what do you do? They might describe it, but when you actually observe them, what they do is different than what they say. So the assumption that a conversation with your user is a 100% um, accurate and informative insight to how they actually perform a task is, is one assumption. And also, even if you were to watch what they do now, you also don't want to make the assumption that what you're going to offer them next should exactly replicate that because you're always looking to improve and add efficiencies to what they do now. So while we explore some of these as assumptions, you also wanted to keep um, an open mind towards opportunities that might arise as you interact, interview, and observe them in their workplace. So yeah. I think a lot of the assumption challenging goes back to having a mindset that even with what you think you know for sure might be um, corrected or altered as you interact more with your end user community. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a really a classic, um, there, there's a classic quote from Henry Ford who said, um, if I asked people what they want, they would have said a faster horse. So if your job is innovation, uh, the way you, you learn about your users is very important. And often just asking them what they want, which is what most people do, doesn't work tremendously well. Steve Jobs uh, also very famously said, that asking people what they want is not a, rate, a good thing for innovation. I want to say one other thing about that, which is the role of UX um, in your lives as entrepreneurs. Um, some of you are, are building products where the product itself is what you're selling. But some of you may be doing something that is not technical at all. Um, I recall one of the uh, uh, projects at, at Keller uh, that I saw last summer was around an orthopedic boot uh, that was being built. But even when you are doing things that are not intrinsically technical, it is inevitable that you will be using technology to attract people, to educate people for customer support. And of course, you're going to be using technology to manage your, co your companies and, and that technical, technological infrastructure, the efficiency with which it works is absolutely critical to the effectiveness of the company and your profitability. So UX had, is absolutely critical um, in, in this world. Any other thoughts uh, from folks that are here? 
All right, then let's move on. Okay, so now let's say, what do we need to understand about our users? Um, so I'm going to share a model with you that I've built, uh, which I have found useful. Um, and it starts with a person and there's a device. This is in this particular case, our person is interacting with a smartphone. Uh, but that device could be many different things. It could be a desktop computer, it could be a tablet, it could be a wearable, um, it could also be a special purpose device, um, something that's um, connected to the internet, part of the internet of things, it could be a kiosk. And what, what we need to do, so what we're doing is we're building interactions between the person and the device. So what are the questions that we can ask about the people? And by the way, I will be delighted to share any of these things with you later. Just I'll give you my email. You can contact me if you want these pictures or, or, or the, the PowerPoint. No, no problems. You don't have to go nuts trying to write it down. Uh, I've identified seven things about the person that I think we need to understand. So the first one is the goals, or sometimes it's called the motivation, which is what does the person want to accomplish? One of the things I think we often don't realize that is totally obvious is that nobody goes to technology unless there's something they want to get out of it. Even if they're playing a game, they're doing it because they want to be amused or they want to have fun. So whether you're on you know, Snapchat or you're, you're playing a game or you're using Excel or Outlook or Google, uh, there is some goal that you have in mind and we need to understand what those goals are, what the person wants to accomplish because that's the only way that we can design for them to effectively reach those goals. The second thing are their behaviors. I'm not completely happy with that word, uh, but I haven't found a better one, which is to understand how people do things. Um, basically, we all have a way that we like to work, we like to operate, and if we understand how people like to behave and how they do behave and how they do their jobs, then we have an opportunity to design interactions that mesh seamlessly with the way they do that. Otherwise, we are asking the people to change their behaviors to fit our software. And that doesn't work terribly well unless you have some kind of relationship with a person where you can demand that they do it. Um, we often talk about the idea of intuition in uh, interaction. We say we want software to be intuitive. Well, what does that mean? It means that it has to work the way people expect it to work. And so that means if we want to build something that's intuitive, it has to fit the behavioral patterns that people have. The third piece of that is knowledge. This is what people come to the interaction with your software. What do they already know? If they don't know, they can't understand it. And if, if, if they don't understand it, then we either have to train them or give them help, or they're not going to be successful. In the educational world, this is around prerequisites. Sometimes we talk about, um, uh, back in the days when I was in grad school, we talked about entering behaviors, which is when you're in a situation where you have to learn something, we have what, what information do you have in your head to start with? Then we have emotions. Um, how do people feel? Are they worried? Are they stressed? Are they excited? Um, how does this affect their ability to use something? I mean, I, I remember very vividly times when it was like Federal Express was coming at 5 p.m. It was about 4.50 p.m. I had 10 minutes to get a proposal completed and into Federal Express or I wouldn't be able to compete for that, uh, that uh, contract. And everything that went that, that slowed me down in the software 
made me absolutely nuts. And so we often have to think in terms of the emotions that the people feel. Then there are limitations. What can't people do? Now, this obviously accessibility is one piece of this. If people are disabled, this is a really big issue. Uh, I've come to a point in my life where my vision is much less acute than it was years ago. And as much as I love Apple's light gray on white, the, rea the reality is I can't see it. And often when I get on my smartphone and I have five point type, I can't see that either. But it's not only the physical limitations. Uh, people may have all sorts of limitations around the way they can interact with software. So it feels like understanding that is important. And finally, beliefs. What assumptions do they have? What biases do they bring to it? What concerns do they have about trust? And trust is a fascinating construct, which we don't have time to go into today, but there's an awful lot of dimensions of what it means to, be tr to, to trust the product that you're working with. Trust that it will be accurate. Trust that it will, it will stay up. Uh, trust that you can, uh, you can count on what the company behind it is doing and that they're, they're not exploiting you for their own benefit. So all of these things fit into it. Then we have the device itself, okay? The device, um, what are its capabilities? Uh, what is it able to do? What resolution does it have? Um, things of that nature. Now we often have to worry about the fact that software has to run on many devices. So we have to now think about how can we make a product work on a smartwatch, on a smartphone, on a tablet, and on a desktop computer, possibly among other kinds of things. And how can we do it at a cost that's reasonable? Uh, there is an argument that says we should build separate software for each one of these devices, but the reality is that the cost of doing that and the work of doing that is um, sometimes more than people want to take on. And then the next aspect of this is the environment. And that's what this box is supposed to show you. People are operating in an environment. Um, I used to do a lot of work on the design of bank ATM machines. I remember um, a couple of examples. One was I was working on a, um, an ATM for a, a very large bank in New York City and they had this ATM that spoke to you. And they thought this was the greatest thing since white bread, you know? Wow, it was the most embarrassing thing for people. Uh, they would go up to this ATM and it would say, insert your card now. And I was always, I said to them, you know, your card has been denied. Uh, we won't give you the loan. Nobody wants other people to hear these things. And uh, as you've probably figured out, there aren't too many of these machines that talk at you in public spaces. Another thing has to do with ambient noise and lighting. Are people, there is an ATM machine right near Princeton, uh, which is a drive up and the way it's designed, when the sun is shining on it, you cannot see the screen at all. Uh, we have this problem with smartphones all the time. Uh, there are often distractions. Uh, people are talking in the background. They're making noise. You're on the street. There's all sorts of stuff happening. So we have to think about all of these things. So I have found this model, uh, which I'm able to, to have on a single page, a really useful thing um, for me to help me um, think about all the aspects of the things I want to understand about my users. Uh, and I, I came up with this little uh, sort of equation at the top, which says that design is built on the person, the environment, and the device. And these are the three general areas that you need to think about. So again, let me open this up to comments, discussions. Does this work for you? Does this make sense? I have a question about this. Sure. So if you can't control the environment that the person is going to be in, or if all of them are going to be in very different environments, for example, if you have an app for a smartphone, how do you think about that? Well, you try to think about 
the way, the places that people are going to use things and think about whether there are ways to, uh, through design, to accommodate that. An example of that um, is that, let's say I'm, uh, I decide I'm using uh, my, I'm, I'm working this in my bedroom late at night. If I'm gonna watch a video, it's awfully nice to have closed captions because otherwise my wife is going to be really annoyed that I'm, I'm listening to video at two o'clock in the morning. So there's a, an example of something where, you know, it's really built for people uh, that are deaf, but it's extremely useful in other kinds of environments. Um, sunlight is always a big problem when, when, when you come to smartphones. Uh, they tend to wash out the screens and it's really, a very difficult thing. Maybe we can, um, you know, work with bigger colors, more bright colors, more contrast, uh, and deal deal with that. So um, let me uh, again ask if anyone has any other thoughts about that. It's a really good question. So how how does the how does aesthetics fit into this picture? I'm sorry, I could not hear that. Sorry, how, how do aesthetics fit into this picture? Aesthetics. The aesthetics of design? Um, aesthetics, you know, did I get that right? You're asking about design aesthetics? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. You know, that's really very interesting because in my early days as a designer, I really, really cared about aesthetics. And uh, I was extremely frustrated when I, 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 very early on, I hated designs that used fluid designs when I couldn't control where everything would appear exactly on the screen and the size of the fonts. And um, what I've learned since then is that a really good designer can maintain a, a high level of aesthetics and still have a lot of fluidity in the designs. Um, you have to be able, you have to think about that from the beginning. So an example of that is text flow. It may be important, for example, for a user, for you to be able to adjust the size of the fonts, either because they are low vision or they're not very good at it or because they're in an environment where it's difficult to see the screen and one of the things you can do is you can enlarge the fonts. If you have it properly, those fonts are going to get cut off on the right side of the screen and you then force people into uh, the need to scroll horizontally. And if you have to scroll horizontally, it's almost impossible cognitively to understand the information that's there. I used to work with a lot of artists and I used to battle with them all the time over aesthetics. I, I, I would argue, I mean, I love aesthetics and I love beauty and I think that it's very, very important that we make our screens beautiful. But that always has to take a second, um, be, be secondary to comprehension, understanding and usability. I think usability has to be first and aesthetics has to be second. I, so I just want to add to a couple of these um, comments. So this, this slide really, uh, in its totality, really makes us think about the context of use, both from the person's perspective and their immediate environment. And if something, if you think about the task that the interface is supposed to support, if somebody complete, can complete that task seamlessly and uh, with clarity and confidence, that in itself is an aesthetic that uh, you really want to keep, um, keep in mind. Like, again, it could be a beautiful system, but if I can't find what I need or it, it's making me um, interact with it a lot in a heavier way because they wanted to reduce and reduce the uh, content that was on the screen for some simplicity's sake, but they went so far that I don't even know what I'm supposed to do, you know, then that's a challenge. So it, you have to gauge this a little bit. And also a little bit about, you know, the environment in a mobile device. 
Um, mobility certainly suggests that people are not stationary when they're interacting with your um, interface or app. So one thing to uh, consider there are some, again, going back to some core concepts of, are you relying on them to recall what they just uh, selected? Or, and, and if they're so distracted by what's around them, they might not be able to, and they'll have to keep going back and forth. Where was I? What did I say? How did I answer the previous question? So um, a lot of the aesthetic and keeping in mind, again, that you're moving around perhaps if you're doing an app is that you have to make um, their ability to complete their test to be uh, straightforward and thoughtful that you know they might not be able to concentrate in one solid setting as if they were perhaps in their home office or even even then you have your distractions but anyway there's a lot to be considered about recognizing that people might be interrupted and how to design to support that. Yeah, you know, I love modern design, uh, but I always am completely, you know, one of the things that just always amuses me are chairs. So I have seen, and it's really interesting if you get on, just get on the internet and Google chairs and then go look at some of the chairs that are there. And there are some chairs out there that have absolutely gorgeous aesthetics. They are so uncomfortable looking uh, that nobody's ever going to want to sit on them. And I actually have some great slides of those, which, which I won't be able to access right now. But I think that that really comes down to the issue that um, usability has to uh, dominate first. If the chair is uncomfortable, if you can't sit there, it doesn't matter how beautiful it is. Um, it just doesn't make sense. And I think that really applies. Uh, to s interactive software as well. Okay, and then so we were talking about why, and now we, we've talked about what we want to understand. And now we want to look at how can we learn about our users and turn our insights into actionable design. There are really three basic techniques. I mean, if you, if you, look at user research literature that's out there on the web. Uh, if you go to the, um, the Nielsen Norman group, which has wonderful um, articles that are free and available on the web, and there's one on user research where they, they list about, I don't know, 27 different techniques uh, of potential uh, ways that you can gather information about your users. But ultimately, they pretty much fall into three categories, it seems to me. So the first one is interviews, which is talking to your users. And generally we talk, we do this on a one-to-one -one basis. Susan, I know you've recently been doing focus groups uh, at Princeton, and maybe a little bit later you can talk about that. Focus groups for some reason uh, are not well regarded within the user experience community. And I've never fully understood why, because I like focus groups a lot, if they're used properly. You get a lot of interesting things. Um, one of the things I thought about, but we don't have time for today, is to talk about how to structure uh, an interview. If anybody's interested, I've got some materials I'd be happy to share on how to, how to do a good interview. This goes back to, you can't just say to people, what do you want? And you have to learn how to ask questions and not lead them and how to listen actively and how to probe and how to warm them up. But once you do that, you can begin to learn an awful lot of information uh, from one-on-one -on -one in-depth conversations. The second thing is observation. It's watching people do whatever it is that you're going to build a project to do better. And um, in, in my uh, past life, when I did a lot of consulting, one of the things I often did was uh, I worked with a lot of call centers. And so I spent a lot of my life in call centers watching uh, call center agents interacting with people. And I would listen, I'd put on a pair of headphones, and I would hear how they did it and watch the screen, and I would see where they had problems. I wanted to understand their pain points. I wanted to understand 
uh, their workflow, and um, that then enabled me to come up with better designs to make their work better and uh, make it easier for them to achieve the work that they wanted to do. And the third thing, which I think is often the strongest and most powerful, is teach me, which is where you have the user teach you how to do what they do. Uh, and I don't care, again, if it's a, somebody at a call center. Um, I remember years and years ago, I was working for Citibank, and I went to the call centers, and I had them teach me how to do, how to be a call center person. And I actually, uh, with them sitting next to me, so I could uh, make people go bankrupt because I gave the wrong information, I actually worked in that process. And there is nothing that, that gives you a deep insight as much as learning to actually do the task the way that they do that. That doesn't necessarily mean that the product you're going to build is going to do exactly the same workflow that they're doing. Maybe you have a better one, but you have to start with people where they are. And uh, so I have found the Teach Me to be very powerful. Any thoughts or questions about that? I do just want to uh, point out to everybody on the team, if you go to our uh, newly modified website at ux.princeton.edu, ux.princeton.edu, there you'll find a menu item called UX Tools. And there is some things you can download about how to conduct interviews and other user research activities. Yeah, one of the things we've tried to do is create tools that you could, and right now they're fairly primitive in that they're basically PDF files that we've put in that give you the guidance of how to do things. The, the vision that I would love to do is ultimately to build interactive tools that become job aids that actually walk you through those processes. And that is often something you wanna do in software as well, which is to say, if you're building a product, it's great if the product you build can actually walk the person through using it and, and getting them to, to uh, execute the tasks that you want. You know, these, are, these are called job aids. There's a lot of good literature on it, but I, it's something for some reason that we have not done enough of, in my opinion, uh, in the software world. Uh, I think a lot of programmers don't find it fun. Um, can I ask a question um, yes, before you uh, go to the next slide? Yeah. Um, so you talked about the three ways to get information from your users, and I can tell each of them actually takes a lot of time and effort. And so how, how would you make your users like, commit to this? It's very, because everyone is very busy, yeah. and, and many of them do not care. And so I wonder what you do to you know, give yeah. them the incentive. That's a very, very good and very important question. Uh, and it's actually worse than you're saying because it's not only the users that you have to deal with, but also the company, often the team that you're working with doesn't want to take the time. Uh, mm -hmm. Often what people want to do is jump in and work on the product. You know, that's fun, let's, let's code, let's build something. Um, so the first thing that I wanna say is that one of the things I have learned, and, and many, many others have, have found this to be true, is that the time you spend studying your users and learning actually reduces the total time that a project is going to take. And that may not be intuitive to a lot of people. If you, um, if you really understand your users, you can build what they want and what they need. And uh, that, that's, that's uh, so that's very important. Now, in terms of the users, you're right. It's often difficult. That's actually one of the biggest problems we have here at Princeton University, because um, a lot of the work is done uh, in OIT here, which is the organization, the Information Technology Office. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the, the stories there is that people are very, very busy and professors are very busy and you can't bother them 
And so very often we are not willing to talk to them. And students are really busy, as you all know. And so often um, we can't, you know, it's, it's difficult uh, to do that. Um, my experience has been that users very often are willing and want very much to participate. They're not, they're not as negative about it as you might think. Nobody wants their time wasted. But people want tools that work for them. And when they see that you're really willing to listen to them, to try to build what it is that they want and what's going to work for them, they very often become your strongest allies and they will help you and they will spend time. But if you can't, and sometimes you can't, you then have to go to what I call secondary sources. And secondary sources are people who know uh, your users but are not your users. In, um, in business, that's often your salespeople. So very often in companies, when I've been consulted, I have found, I've worked for companies that have said, we will not allow you to contact our customers mm -hmm. for various reasons. Um, and in those cases, I'd say, okay, then let me talk to your salespeople. Because those salespeople really know the customers, they spend a lot of time talking with them, and they can serve as surrogates uh, for the customers. And similarly, uh, even here at the university, there are people on staff that I will talk to and they, they work frequently with students and they work frequently with the faculty. And so they will give us that information. It's probably not as good as if we work directly, you know, with, with the, the users, but it's the best you can do. I'll just add a note about, uh, you know, users might not care in this whole, this whole, how to reach out. Um, Sorry. You know, there's, there's a, trend about co-creating and um, really doing something that's very uh, mutually beneficial. Mm -hmm. And as Charlie was suggesting, when the end users say, you know, you're giving them early insight, early access to something that they may use. And if they feel like they had a role in the design, it is true that they will become their advocate. And then, you know, sometimes you're buying them a cup of coffee along the way and mm -hmm you know, all that's okay. And I also think another uh, aspect of this is on the early on in the project stages, you have to set expectations and you have to describe to your team and your stakeholders that you fully plan to engage with users continuously and often throughout the project. And when you set up that expectation, then it's not, um, interpreted as a pause what do you mean we have to wait and get feedback from our users mm -hmm. all along it was anticipated that you know you wouldn't really start coding until you tested out the prototype on actual end users so a lot of it is setting expectations inviting people in in a fun um participatory way and especially you know if, if what you're producing is not an app or a digital interface sometimes you might be designing a service or program of engagement, you know, it really behooves you to try them out before you commit and print out all the materials for a program that all of a sudden nobody's going to use because they didn't feel like they were part of the design all along. So again, it depends on what you are designing, but whatever effort you do make um, will certainly uh, be very valuable in, in your return on that investment. Yeah, one technique I've often used uh, is to create a user advisory board uh, mm -hmm. so that I will identify users who are interested in participating and um, I, I'll create a group of them. And uh, as, as Susan mentions, uh, participatory design is often really a very interesting way to go. And, um, I happen to be a designer who's not frightened of designing on the fly. Some designers get very nervous about this. But if you have a lightweight environment to design in, and you have to have something that's very flexible and easy to use, um, I will, I mean, I've actually run all sorts of sessions where the users come in and we talk about it and I say, well, how about this? And I start designing stuff right in front of them. And we talk about it. And it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be the final design of the system, 
but working in uh, in concert with the users together, we we jointly come up with an initial design, and that is very helpful. And th where, where that also uh, is helpful is that these users, you want to get your product out there. And to get your product out there, you need influencers who are going to carry it into the market. And these people that you've worked with initially may also be very useful um, because they're going to love this product they help design. They will help bring others into it, and they become the people who bring, who become the influencers that that start the market marketing for you. Charlie, yeah. My name is Rick Curtis. So one just observation about what you're talking about has to do with kind of the role of power. Um, like as an end user at the university, you, you talked about OAT designing systems and they don't feel like they can take faculty's time or take students' time. So they are sort of experiencing this sort of sense of powerlessness. So they, they don't tap into that the, you know, those assessments and needs. And then I know when I get told to use a particular system that somebody at OIT has designed, I often find that it totally doesn't meet my needs at all. And so now as the end user, now I feel really powerless um, to be able to actually impact the process. You know, a good example is the university just shifted its whole time collection system and the way it works for student employees, it works, I think, pretty well for, for regular line staff, but um, it totally was designed not thinking about student employees, which is all I manage, and it's a huge headache, and it's actually much worse than the old system. Yeah, it, I actually was called in, uh, I believe, on that at one point, and I thought it was just down the wrong path, uh, so I got booted out of that meeting. Um, fairly quickly, but you, you, you are you're absolutely right, and um, it's it's a very difficult thing. And one of the things that we've tried to do in the user experience office, and part of the reason we're so eager to work with folks here at Keller is that by connecting with students, um, we begin to under, we're more connected to the university community. We unfortunately are off campus where. 701 uh, Carnegie Center. Uh, we're not there every day. And uh, that does, to a certain extent, isolate you. One of the things I did last year um, was I brought a bunch of students into a leadership meeting at, um, at, o at OIT, and everybody loved it. I mean, and, and what we, we now have a committee that's trying increasingly to connect with students and uh, bring that in. And I've talked with faculty about this issue, and it may be true that some of the senior faculty who are maybe less technically oriented uh, are not as receptive, but I have not found that in the younger faculty members. They are usually delighted to work on this stuff and talk about it, and many of them are UX people uh, in their own right and, and are very interested in it. So your, your point is extremely well taken. Thank you for uh, your response. And just like one short comment uh, back to, you mentioned like a software that can walk people through, um, like how to using things. And, and so I, I am very interested in that product as well. Um, so um, if there's anything, uh, you know, come up, and I wonder if it's possible to keep me updated. Sorry, I don't know yeah. if that's, okay. So, um, you know, we could talk a lot about how that can and should work. Again, the problem you often run into is it's, people don't like to do it because it's more work. Mm -hmm. uh, help is sort of, you know, people try to do it in the cheapest, fastest possible way rather than integrating it deeply into the design process and the build process. Um, many years ago, I had to build a, a piece of software to uh, manage an atomic absorption photospectrometer. And this was a device that was used by a wide range of users. On the one hand, we had PhD chemists who used it. 
And on the other hand, it was used in testing laboratories for things like water testing uh, by people who probably had no academic training whatsoever. And the problem was how could you build uh, a system that could work for all of them? And we were very successful actually. And we did it by building different user interfaces so that you could bring in some that sort of walked you through wizards a step at a time. Um, well, I've done some really interesting work where we've had user interfaces where it trains you as you go through it. And then as you get better, you can drop out the training and you can find shortcuts. So as you become more of a power user, you can find faster ways to use the same, uh, the same software. Doing this means you really have to have an understanding of how people learn and how people think, and you have to have a willingness to, uh, to build the sort of stuff into the software itself. Um, there was, uh, a, 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 some years ago, there was, uh, um, a, uh, a movement, it was called, I think, Training on Demand, where basically the idea was that if you're using software and you didn't know what to do, you would hit a button and it would take you right into training. Uh, I've noticed that some of the startups are building fairly uh, good user interfaces uh, for their websites that at least orient people as they're coming in. So I'm seeing this this done done better, okay. and uh, certainly again, you know, anything that we can do to help any of you, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us. We're happy to try to find you the information or share it with you. Thank you. I, I wanted to shift to what I'm calling mapping. So mapping, there are ver various techniques for mapping. And mapping transforms data into insights. So we gather all of this information, and the trouble is we don't know what to do with it, right? We, we interview, you know, 30 people. And now what we have are 30 um, results of the interviews. And the problem is, how do you take that information and turn it into something that you can actually use to gain insights and that's actionable? And there are a bunch of mapping techniques that are out there, and they tend to be pretty straightforward and pretty simple. These are things you can learn to do quite quickly. So I wanted to share a few of those with you. So the first one I wanted to start with is the persona. And uh, personas became popular in the, the late 1990s. Uh, they were actually popularized by two people, one of them, Don Norman, uh, and the other one is Alan Cooper. And I first learned about personas when I was at a conference and I was having coffee with Alan Cooper, and he taught me about this. And I had never thought about this idea before. I was running a design uh, company at the time. Um, and he, he had been working with one of the airlines and he was designing the, uh, the uh, systems that went into the back of the airline seats. And he said, you know, everybody who's sitting in a seat is not the same. Uh, there are children, there are old people, there are highly technical people. We have to be able to design something that works for all of these. And so he started building these models of people uh, that he called personas. And I was just mind blown by it. And since then, I've done a fair amount of persona work. And I think used properly, it can be very, very powerful. And I call it a container um, because the persona is the thing that you can, if you do it right, you can put all sorts of data into it. If you do it wrong, um, you can waste a lot of time. So let's talk about what a persona is. A persona is a model of a user. It's expressed as a specific person. Um, there are two different kinds. There are actually two different kinds of personas. There are marketing personas, which are the persona of a buyer. buyer and then there are uh, user personas where we're trying to figure out how, uh, what the person who's using the software looks like. 
but there are also personas that are that are built out of data and that's ideally what you want to do but going back to some of the comments you made earlier sometimes you can't get the data and so often what a team will do is it'll sit around and build what's called a proto persona um, which is they they do their best to brainstorm who the different users are and this goes back to that very first question about do we take our users as a given the answer is no we try to figure out who our key personas are and then that persona becomes the voice of the user let me show you a couple of examples so this is an actual persona that i built some years ago for a a credit union um, and they it was actually they this was something new to them and they loved it the whole idea of personas in fact they liked these so much that they had us build um cutouts cardboard cutouts that they put around their organization so they could get to know the different people and we interviewed about a hundred different people all over um all over the place to uh, learn about the different kinds of people that use the credit union. Now, this is a fairly small component, uh, uh, persona, but you can see the basic idea here. Uh, very typically, you put a picture in, um, you give them a name, you give them, often give them a quote, and that, and you come up with something that sort of encapsulates who they are. You put in key attributes, uh, and then you may put in some analytic things. Here I put in a little graphic thing that talks about how likely they are to use online shopping, online banking, social media, and email. And you can see this, this guy does a fair amount of online shopping. He doesn't use a whole lot of online banking, barely uses social media at all, uh, but does use email because he's a retired executive. In the center of this, what I have is a story. Uh, sometimes this is called a day in the life story. And it, it, it sort of is a scenario that talks about this person. Now the idea, this person does not actually exist. He is a composite of probably 20 different people that I interviewed. And, um, but what happens is by giving him a name, and by putting it in this way, people can start designing to him. I can I could take this to other stakeholders and say, here's an example of one of your customers, right? And they begin, and then we can say, well, what would Bill Hoffman say about this? And what would make Bill happy? And what would upset Bill Hoffman? And how would he feel? And so it becomes something that informs design and helps the designers operate. This is another persona. This one was done by Adobe. Um, and I guess I have really mixed feelings about this one, which is why I put it on. So if you look over on the right, you see they did personality. I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, the uh, what, now I'm blocking on the name, the uh, test that uh, uh, puts people into typologies. Here's great. Remember the name of that? This is. Myers-Briggs. I'm sorry? Myers-Briggs. Yes, thank you. The Myers-Briggs. Um, so I don't know how, how valuable it is to put the Myers-Briggs in there. Uh, then they put the technology in there. So, you know, various things they use, which I had in the other one. Um, they give him a name, an age, an occupation, some demographics, uh, again, a picture. Uh, they talk about motivations, goals, frustrations, pain points are very useful, and a little bit of a, uh, a bio, and then brands that he likes to use. Um, so if you go, all you have to do is go on Google and type in Persona UX, and you will find hundreds of different personas that you can look at. Some of them are very beautiful. Some of them are very long. 
I didn't know how to do it here, but I've got one that I developed that's I think eight pages long. And the stories are really extensive. Um, or you can have something like the prior slide I showed you where I actually built them on PowerPoint slides. Now, let's talk a little bit about it. Um, how do you see the value of personas and what limitations do you think they might have? Um, Charlie, I just want to point out that we have maybe 20 minutes left. Yes. And, um, you know, if somebody has a pressing question about personas, you know, we'll take that. But I think uh, if you want to get to the next section, you might just need to move on. Yeah, we will go as far as we can go. All right, if I don't hear any, then I will take your advice and move on. Let me share with you, here are some of the values of personas. Um, so they answer the question who we're designing for. They help the designers empathize with the users. They avoid self-referential design, which is the assumption that the persona is the same as me, right? They give you a basis for design decisions. You can say, what would Bill Hoffman feel about this? Well, he would really hate this. And you know, perhaps you shouldn't do it. You can deal with priorities and they're very useful for dealing with stakeholders. Uh, if you're having to deal with your funders, with others who are involved, <coughs> pardon me. Um, the state, you know, these are useful. In terms of limitations, uh, they can mislead you into thinking you know your users, perhaps that you picked the wrong attributes. It may be difficult to synthesize research data that you built on assumptions rather than data and that you created too many personas to work with. So in terms of that, here's what I would recommend. If you're building personas for your product, generally you want to have a minimum of two you rarely, if ever, want to have a maximum of six. And typically, I try to go with about three. Um, and then what you typically do is you divide them into primary and secondary personas. The idea is you design for your primary personas, and then you try to accommodate your secondary personas, because you can't design for everybody. Um, the tricky part is that you have to learn to combine personas with similar needs, even though they have different roles. So again, we may find that a student and a faculty member, you think they are different roles, but in fact, they're actually exactly the same in terms of their needs. So if you can collapse them into a single persona, that's best. You'll usually start with proto personas, which means you're gonna brainstorm them and then validate them, gather data. One of the things I've, I've never actually done, but I've always thought would be great, would be to post the personas up on the web and talk to your users or your customers and say, this is what we think you are. Are we right or are we wrong? Give us feedback and let the users actually help us revise the personas. And focus on the attributes that make a difference. Going back to this Myers-Briggs that Adobe was doing, I don't know if that's gonna make a difference in the designs. There's a paper I have that if anybody wants, I'll be happy to share with you by um, a fellow named Olson. It's 18 pages of information that you can put into a persona. It's just like this, you know, very, very long list of different things that you can study about a person. There are, there's probably, you know, 100 or 125 in there. Obviously, you're not going to do this. So what you want to do is pick uh, pick the uh, the people that it, where it's going to work. Now, I want to share a couple of mapping techniques that you can use as you're developing these personas. So one of these is what's called an empathy map. And an empathy map, they're very simple. And typically you use them after interviews and you can use them for an individual person and you can use them to aggregate multiple people. And there are just four things you ask about a user, which is what do they say, what do they do, what do they think, and what do they feel. 
Um, these are used primarily by designers early as a team activity in, in early in the uh, design process. So here's an example. I was thinking about a teacher using Zoom. So, you know, the Zoom is fascinating because uh, they had 10 million users until a couple of weeks ago, and now they have 200 million users. And they didn't design for teachers, they designed for business users. So how might a teacher, uh, a third grade teacher, let's say, who suddenly has to use Zoom, uh, what might your empathy map look like? They might say things like, I don't, I'm not sure how to do this. I don't know where to start. Is there another option? They're thinking it's too hard. It's not a good tool. They'll look stupid. Um, in terms of uh, how they're feeling, they might feel stupid, overwhelmed, inadequate, scared. And then we can see what they do, particularly in usability uh, testing. So it's just a very simple technique. Again, the Nielsen Norman group has a, a couple of articles on how to do these. Uh, I, I'll tell you honestly, I was somewhat skeptical about these, but I was talking with my daughter who um, is in the pharmaceutical industry and told me that she uses these all the time as they're designing um, uh, um, advertising for new drugs. I want to, and again, I'm going to very quickly just share these ideas with you, and you may, you'll have to research them a little bit uh, to learn how to use them. Jobs to be done is a very interesting technique that um, it was developed by a fellow by the uh, Professor Christensen at Harvard University. He's got an article in the Harvard Business Review that you can look up. Now, if, you, if you've been involved at all in uh, user stories, uh, agile development, there are a lot of user stories that people build. This is an alternative way to build user stories, and it's focused on outcomes rather than technology. So think about this nice Dyson um, vacuum cleaner that I've got here. If you take a JTB10 approach, what you say is people don't build vacuum cleaners, or they don't buy vacuum cleaners. What they want to buy are clean carpets. Or the traditional thing is nobody wants a quarter inch drill, they want a quarter inch hole. So what we try to do in a JTBD story is we don't focus on the product, but we focus on the outcome. And by focusing on the outcome, we can then think about what product alternatives do we have to achieve that outcome. And people who are big in jobs to be done believe that this is the best way to do innovation because through innovation, because by not focusing on the product, but focusing on outcomes, you can come out with new ways of doing it. For example, you don't need a vacuum cleaner. Maybe, um, you know, I, I guess, uh, what somebody said is if you write traditional stories, you would think about better and better vacuum cleaners. But if you use jobs to be done, you're going to think about designing a Roomba because it's a more innovative technique that gets you the same outcome. Typically in a jobs to be done story, there are three parts to it, a situation, a need, and an outcome. So here's an example um, of a, a JTB story. So when I'm hungry and I'm driving in my car, that's the situation. I need something I can eat that's not messy. I can't tell you how many times I've had to go to a meeting with something all over my shirt because I dropped it there. So I can satisfy my hunger without staining my shirt. And here's another one. Uh, this is a classic. Uh, when a new customer signs up, I want to be notified so I can start a conversation with them. Again, it doesn't tell me what the product is. It tells me what the outcome is. Give you a moment if you have any questions or thoughts. Now, you can build these into the persona. 
So when you're building the persona, we talk about stories and same thing with the empathy map. So you can build an empathy map and you can put it in there and say what they think, do, you know, feel. Um, in the, and you can then have a series of jobs to be done in there and talk about the situations, the needs and the outcomes that this particular persona wants. Now we're gonna go to the final one I wanna talk about, which is the user journey map. These are incredibly powerful. Um, there are some, I have a, there's a very good article that was published in Medium uh, a couple of years ago that I can, I'd be happy again to share with you if you're interested in this. Susan is actually expert in this area and I would like to see a lot more done on, on this. I'm going to just give you the sort of very basics about this. So a user journey, so this is, an old, this is not an alternative to a persona, but um, I guess you could put it in a persona, but these are more typically used separately. So a user journey map is a visualization of the steps that a user goes through to accomplish the goal. So I put in a user journey for eating at a restaurant, something we, we can't do these days. Um, so you arrive at the restaurant, you're seated, you're given the menu and you read it, you order your food, you're served, you eat and you pay your bill. Now, obviously we could build a much more detailed user journey map about this, but I didn't have more room on the slide. Each one of these boxes is called a touch point. It's a place where the user interacts with uh, my company or with my products. Now, this line, you see this line right over here between the blue and the red boxes is called the line of interaction. And the red boxes show the staff actions that correspond to the customer actions. So I arrive at the customer, the staff greets me. Then I want to be seated, so the maitre d' takes me to the table. And then I want to read the menu, the menu has to be offered to me and explaining the details and so on and so forth. So by doing this, we see the relationship between the customer actions and the staff actions. Now in a company, you don't only have um, actions that relate directly to the customers because there's a kitchen that's in the back. So we have another line over here. And this line with this very thick black line is separating what's called the front stage from the back stage. The front stage is the stuff that the customer directs. The back stage is what's happening that the customer doesn't see. So I put a couple of these in and sometimes it's difficult um, to line these things up um, with, the, with the customer. And, and sometimes you end up, when you look at these, they, they get all sorts of lines that go back and forth. But essentially, once the waiter has taken the order, it has to be transmitted to the kitchen and then they have to cook the food. And that food is then given to the waiter so they can serve the customer. For all of this to happen, there's a set of resources that are needed. And those, are, uh, those resources are also typically placed into the backstage area. And these are the resources, the processes, the things that your company needs to have to support the operations. So let me I have to move the, yep. So for example, refrigeration, you can cook the food if you don't have refrigerators and you have to have power to run those refrigerators. You have to have an inventory system that keeps track of the food that you've got. You have to have an accounting system that keeps track of the money and you have to uh, have a system that will, after they bust the table and they bring the dirty dishes in, you need to be able to wash them. Many years ago, that was my job. I washed the dishes. Uh, in a kitchen. Susan, I want to invite you because I know this is an area that you're very expert in to talk a little bit about uh, these journey maps. And I guess when you have all four of these, uh, it, it would be called a service blueprint. Is that correct? Yeah. 
so um, what Charlie has shown on the screen right now, the top half alone is a, is a user journey. But when you're trying to design um, an interface or a program or a service that will impact that user journey, that's where it really behooves you to understand what are the backend processes that impact the overall user experience. So that's where in the second half, you see this backstage area and together the user journey in the backstage process area, that's called the service blueprint. And there are lots of um, variations on this as well, but one um, outcome of, of going through this effort of creating a service blueprint is to identify gaps in the user experience where you have an opportunity to create an intervention that would improve the overall outcome of the user experience. And um, when you say, well, you know, it's really, you know, people seem to be most aggravated, let's say in this example, between the time of reading the menu and ordering the food. And, you know, depending on how you tease out this journey, you could just focus on that one segment of the journey or whatever it may be to design something to improve the overall experience. So this yeah, let me is just uh, overview sorry. of the um, end end experience. But when you want to um, design something to address a specific gap, then you want to delve into one segment in more details and just tease out a little bit more about the various roles and the, the um, some of the nuances or complexities of who's doing what and who's and what kinds of um, dialogues are going on and backstage processes that may be uh, contributing to the gap or could be better designed to fulfill a, a gap. But this is certainly a great way to tease out what is going on from the user's perspective during any uh, exchange, and in this case, going to a restaurant. You know, you might notice at the very back, and again, I ran out of screen space, I have a line that says pain points and a line that says opportunities. And I find this to be incredibly powerful. So think about if you go to a restaurant, we go to that first thing that says arriving at the restaurant. What is a pain point? Well, one pain point is if you can't park at the restaurant, you're going to be uncomfortable. What opportunities as, as the owner of this restaurant does that create for me? Right. And That's the opportunity why might be, what? Right, and that's why you might have valet parking where you exactly. might not have had it before. Exactly. Um, I also just will remind people on the call that again, if you go to ux.princeton.edu under the UX tools, I believe we do have a PDF description I, I created on, um, on this journey mapping and, and these kinds of processes. Yeah. So again, um, yeah, we only have a few minutes. So go ahead, Charles. We have actually just four minutes uh, left. And in fact, that was my last slide. So I, I'd like to just use the remaining three minutes now to just give anybody an opportunity to ask any questions or, or make any comments you might, you might want to do. Um, so the idea of co-creating. Yeah a product with the users. I think it has, I mean, you mentioned that this has been a recent trend in product designing and I can see what are the benefits of it, but do we know what are the shortcomings or risk involved in such kind of process? That's interesting. I, I, I'm not aware of any. Uh, I'm not aware, I, I think again, it. it it speaks to setting up uh, expectations for all those involved. Um, you know, perhaps in the end, your project might not uh, deploy in the time that you might have told some of the participants. So that might be a risk and might say, oh, whatever happened to that? And there could be various uh, reasons why um, they might not actually see the end product or their input in the first iteration of the product. But again, I think it just, um, the the value of getting uh, direct input and feedback early on from a variety of participants and end users is is so high that it um, pretty much outweighs the risks, especially if, if you can manage your um, 
expectations and your relationships with your customers appropriately. Yeah, I have never had a bad experience working with users. I mean, in all the years that I've been doing this, it is so powerful and so useful. Um, I can't think of anything negative. I do want to really thank you for coming again. I want to thank Susan for taking the time to, to, to co-teach and help. And uh, let me say we, uh, we had originally planned on three of these, but we, uh, the one for next week we canceled because we figured it would be very difficult to talk about user testing, um, usability testing in, the, in, in this remote environment. So we'll have to put that off until we can, we can do it face to face. But in two weeks, uh, we're going to have a session uh, where we'll talk about writing for the web and how to create content that people can effectively consume. And I'd be delighted to see you there. Harley, thank you so much. This has really been great. And thank you to everyone who has participated. Um, and we do hope to see you in two weeks on April 24th. And also, before I forget, I know I don't want to steal Charlie's thunder, but we do have another workshop next week. Um, it's on, I think, like sales and business 101 for entrepreneurs and startups. So check our website and hope you're registered for both webinars coming up and um, hope you all have a lovely day and weekend and please stay safe. And um, we're always here if you need us for anything. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you, thank you so much. Day. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome.